After the service tonight, if we can set up the tables for the uh, meeting in the back, that would be helpful if everybody could do that. Verse 1 of chapter 35 is where I get the title of this message, And God Said. And God Said. Genesis chapter 34 is one of the darkest chapters in the Bible. In this chapter, we have a record of partial or almost obedience, horrible parenting, rape, deceit, and lies using religion for personal gain and evil ends, murder, theft, kidnapping, enslaving, unbelief, despair, and hopelessness. I've said before, the Bible's not family friendly. And this is indeed a dark chapter that God has revealed for his own holy purposes. Chapter 34, verse 1. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Now this is spoken of in a way that we wouldn't generally read it. Dinah, I would think the daughter of Jacob, but the scripture doesn't say that. Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob. Uh, we're going to see by the time this chapter is over where Dinah could have had some serious issues because of the way her father treated her and the way her father did her. Dinah the daughter of Leah. Now, this was in the land of Shechem. Shechem is the way it's pronounced, Shechem. And this is not where God told Jacob to go. He was told to go back to Bethel, and he doesn't. This is called partial obedience. It was only about 20 miles away. He was almost there. But he didn't go where he was instructed to go, but bought some land in Shechem, about 20 miles from where he was directed by God to go, Bethel, that place where God first made himself known. Remember when the ladder was let down from heaven and set upon the earth. Now this could be called partial obedience or almost obedience. He came close to the place God said to go. That's like almost faith. I trust Christ 99% of the way. What good will that do you? It will not help you at all. Now, none of the things that took place in this chapter would have taken place had not Jacob simply obeyed what God said and gone to Bethel. But he didn't. He stopped in Shechem. But thank God, God brings good out of evil. He always does. I'm so thankful. Dinah, most believe her to be 13 or 14 years old. And she goes out to see the daughters of the land. Uh, where is the parental control at this time? She's just a little girl, yet she goes out to see the daughters of the land. And Jacob's uh, actions toward her are not appropriate as we are going. Well, let's, let's read verses 2 through 5. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, this 13 or 14 year old girl, he took her 
and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. Now that's an inappropriate response. If your daughter is defiled like that, are you going to hold your peace? Uh, Jacob's response was not appropriate. Now, verse 2, when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of that country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. This little 13, 14-year-old girl. And whether it's statutory rape, that's rape, or actually raping her, what great wickedness that took place. And his soul, the one who defiled her, clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He was infatuated with her. He loved her. He loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. He was taken up with this woman, this girl that he defiled. And Shechem spake unto his father, Hamar, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he defiled Dinah, his daughter. There was no action at this point. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. Verse 6. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And we don't read where Jacob said anything at this point. This man with his son has come into Jacob's presence. Jacob knew what took place. What does he do? Nothing. Verse 7, And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and they were very wroth. I would think this is the way Jacob would have responded over something like this, but he didn't. But his boys did. They were grieved. And they were very wroth because he'd wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter. <clears throat> Which thing ought not to be done? You know, there's a lot of things that just ought not to be done. This is one of them. Verse 8, And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you, give her him to wife, and make ye marriages with us. Give your daughters unto us and take our daughters unto you and you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein and get you possession therein. Now we don't read where uh, Jacob said anything at this time. Verse 11, And Shechem said unto her father, unto, his fa unto her father, this is Shechem speaking to Jacob, and unto her brethren, the sons of Jacob, let me find grace in your eyes. And what you shall say unto me, I'll give. Ask me never so much, dowry and gift. And I'll give according to as you shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. I'll pay anything. Verse 13. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully. Now they already had a plan and Jacob was not privy to this plan. Jacob was okay with what was said. Okay, we'll do that. He wasn't going to seek justice with regard to what took place with his daughter. He was okay with it, but his sons had other plans. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully and said, because and said, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that's uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. 
Now look, they're going to use religion. They're going to use true religion in a deceptive way to get what they want. We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that's uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this will we consent unto you, if you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised. Then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you'll not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we'll take our daughter and we will be gone. We're, this has to be done. And the words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. They agreed, we're going to be circumcised. And the young men deferred not to do the thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter and he was more honorable than all in the house of his father. I think it's interesting how the scripture points out some honor that this man had. I mean, it was what he did was a crime. It was wicked. He was infatuated with this young girl and he uh, was more honorable than all the other men of his house. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came into the gate of the city and communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade therein. For the land, behold, it's large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives. Let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent unto us to dwell with us to be one people. If our every male circumcised, as they are circumcised, show, shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours. Money talks, doesn't it? Money talks. And that is what he is using. We're going to be financially enriched by doing this. It'll be difficult uh, temporarily, but we're going to be enriched. And they will dwell with us. And unto Hamor, unto Shechem, his son, hearkened all that went out of the gate of his cities, and every male was circumcised. All that went out of the gate of his city. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore. You know, I imagine what kind of infection could take place in something like that. I mean, there's all kinds of dangerous things that could have happened. They could have been very sick, unable at this time to defend themselves. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, remember we read about them in Genesis Chapter 49, and Jacob points this out about these two men where he says instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon all the city boldly and slew all the males. They killed everybody. And they slew Hamor. And Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Shechem's house. The sons of Jacob came upon all the slain, and they spoiled the city because they defiled their sister. They took their sheep, their oxen, their asses, and that which was in the city, and that which is in the field, and all their wealth, and all their little ones, and their wives, took they captive, and spoiled even all that was in the house. This is evil. That's all you can call it. What Shechem did was evil. This was murderous, pillaging, plundering. Now look what Jacob says. Jacob didn't know anything about this. He wasn't in on this with Simeon and Levi. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you've troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I, being a few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me. Now, God said the Messiah is going to come to you, but he forgot it this time. And I understand why. I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, should he deal with our sisters with a harlot? Shouldn't we have done this? Didn't we do the right thing? Now, there's something in that language that's not conveyed 
very well in this translation. And I need to bring this out because I believe it casts so much light on the next verses, the first few verses of chapter 35. Every action is spoken of in the perfect tense in the Hebrew, which means every action is a completed action. Let me read you Young's literal translation. They have been gathered against me. They have smitten me. And I have been destroyed and my house. All of these things are said as completed actions. Jacob was so sure of his defeat, he reached, I believe, the lowest point in his life. He speaks of these things as already having taken place. He says it like this. You've troubled me. You've made me odious. You've made me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I, being few in number, they have gathered themselves together against me. They have slain me. And I have been destroyed. I and my house. Now that is the language. Everything is spoken of as a completed action. What's that make you think of? This is a picture of our fall in Adam. Our ruin in Adam. A thing that has already been done. We're troubled by the sin of another. Now, I can't say in saying that with regard to Adam's sin, I'm troubled by the sin of another because I committed it when he did. I was united to him. But yet I have been troubled by the sin of another that's made me to stink and to be odious. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, and I and my house are stinking, dead, and destroyed. Now that's where Jacob is at at this time. He's reached his lowest position, and oh, how frustrated he is with his sons. You have made me to stink. Verse 1 of chapter 35, and God said, <laughs> here's the hope, and God said unto Jacob, arise. We heard that song this morning, arise my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears. Well, I'll tell you when I arise, when he tells me to. I'll stay down there until he says arise. And he says to Jacob, arise, go to Bethel. That's the place where God first appeared to him. And God revealed the gospel to him in a ladder. I think that is so beautiful. It's so simple. It's a ladder. Heavens were opened. A ladder was sent down from heaven and set up upon the earth. And the scripture says the angels of God descended and descended on that ladder, that ladder. And that is speaking of Christ, the mediator, the one way into God's presence, the one way into heaven. Now, I, I love this verse of scripture. This is Christ, the mediator, when he said, I am the way. And listen to me. He didn't say, I'll show you the way. He didn't say, I'll lead you along the way. He said, I'm it. I am the truth. I love that. I am the truth. Not I'll show you the truth or I'll teach you the truth. I am the truth. I am the life. Not even I, I am the life. The only way you're going to be able to approach the Father is by my life being your life before God. Do you believe that? I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That's what that ladder led down from heaven. All of God's blessings coming through that ladder 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. Any prayer of my faith comes, my desire comes through the Lord Jesus Christ is accepted simply because of Christ. There is no other reason. That's the latter. Christ, that's where God revealed himself to Jacob at Bethel, the house of God. Now, look what he says. And, Jacob, and God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and what next? Dwell there. Stay there. Don't leave there. Any departure from this is away from God. This is the same thing as saying, abide in Christ. Stay there. Don't go anywhere else. Be satisfied to simply be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul put it this way in Philippians 3, 9, Oh, that I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. I don't want to have anything to do with that. But that which is through the faithfulness of Christ, the perfect obedience of Christ, which is nothing less than the righteousness of God, which is by faith. You go to Bethel and you stay there. And you do not leave that place. Now that's what I'm called upon to do. That's what you're called upon to do. Go to Bethel and stay there. We're made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. You stay there. I think of what... Um, Colossians 2, uh, turn with me to Col hold your finger there and turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As ye therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, had you received Christ Jesus the Lord? You received him as the only hope you had. And you received him joyfully. You were very thankful to be saved by Christ. You really believed that he was all you had. You didn't have anything else to bring to the Father. Only him. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Abiding in Christ. Now he tells Jacob, get up, go to Bethel, the place where I revealed myself to you, and stay there. Don't go anywhere else. And there make an altar unto God. Now what's an altar for? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. <clears throat> the only way Jacob or you or I can be saved and accepted by a holy God is the sacrifice of Christ. I want you to think of the sufficiency of his sacrifice. You know, when God gave the Ten Commandments, I love the Ten Commandments. I love Exodus chapter 20. It reflects the holy character of God. What took place after he gave the Ten Commandments? Build an altar. Build an altar. Why? He knew they wouldn't keep him. <laughs> Build an altar. And there were two instructions with regard to that altar. Number one, no tool could touch it. It was to be made of unhewn stones, not stones formed by men. This is God's work alone. And you know what the second requirement with regard to that altar? You couldn't have any steps to that altar. There's no steps you need to, make, to take to make the sacrifice of Christ work. Works he by himself purged our sins. There's no steps right now, even right now as I'm sitting here, there's no steps you need to take to make that sacrifice work. No hewn stones, 
no steps. As a matter of fact, he says, if you, if you put steps on that altar, all it will do is expose your nakedness. The only hope you and I have is the complete, sufficient, glorious, saving, sin-atoning, complete, perfect sacrifice of Christ. You build there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau some twenty-some years before. And Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with it, put away the strange gods that are among you. Evidently they had idols. Anything that's not the God of the Bible, get rid of it. No strange gods. I wish I could emphasize this as it ought to be emphasized. But God is one God. He is who he is. And we bow to who he is as he is in his word. And we're to have no strange, false, wrong concepts, idolatrous concepts of God. Any idolatry that you and I are guilty of is only trying to bring God down to our level. It's any comparison we make of God. Well, God's like this. God's like, no, he's not. No, he's not. He's altogether other. There's nothing you and I can compare him to. Get rid of any false concept of God. This is the God of the Bible, and you know what? We're proud of him. I'm not proud of myself, but I'm proud of him. And I'm proud of the gospel we believe. It's a gospel that cannot be improved in any way. It's a gospel that glorifies God. Get rid of any false concept you have of God. And be clean. Be clean. Now, I know from the scriptures that that is a glorious command. And when was the leper declared to be clean? When he came to the priest, overall covered with leprosy. That is when he was declared to be clean. I know what the leper did who came to Christ. I know what he knew. He said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And he said, I will be thou clean. And change your garments. Make sure the only thing you have on is the wedding garment. The righteousness and the merits of Jesus Christ. And let us arise, verse 3, and go up to Bethel, and I'll make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. Every believer can say that without exception. Verse 4, And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. Now there's some significance to that. Uh, these earrings somehow were a hindrance to hearing. And they got rid of that which hindered them in hearing. And Jacob hid them, buried them under an oak, which was by Shechem. Now on this journey, it's a 20-mile journey, and they journeyed. And remember how afraid he was of the Canaanites and the Perizzites? Look what it says regarding these people. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were around about them. And they didn't pursue after the sons of Jacob. They were scared to death. There wasn't anything they could do. Their hands were tied. The terror of God was upon them. Now this is a reminder to us of the adorable providence of God. It's this way all the time. All the time. God rules and reigns in every event and you're protected by him. Just the way they were. Verse 6, so Jacob came to Luz. That's the place where God first met him. Bethel, it means the house of God. 
So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar, just like God told him to, and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he had fled from the face of his brother. He built the altar. I, our, our house is always around the altar, isn't it? The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, Jacob had known her all of his life, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of the place was called Alambachuth, which means the oak of weeping. Now, do you know even dwelling in Bethel, you're going to have sorrow. The oak of weeping. You're going to have trials. It's going to happen. It did with Jacob. And God appeared unto Jacob again, verse 9. Aren't you thankful for that? God appeared to Jacob again. And you know, he appears to every one of his people again and again and again. When he came out of Padanaram and blessed him, and God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. If you'll remember, that name means supplanter, cheat, deceiver. And Jacob was all of those things. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. And he repeats what he taught him in chapter 32. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel, a prince with God, one that has power with God. And this is true of every believer. Do you know, not that you have any power in and of yourself, but you've got the ear of God. He responds to you for Christ's sake. And you have power over men. You see, they're in God's hand, and they won't do anything more than he allows them to do. You're a prince. That's true of every believer. You're a prince, a prince of God. You have power with God, men, and you've prevailed. And God said unto him, and this is the same thing that he said to Abraham and Isaac, exact, the exact same covenant. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall come of thee and kings shall come out of thy loins. Many kings. King David, uh, the king of kings can't be said to come out of his loins, but he came through that line. The king of kings was born of a virgin, but he came through this line. And I think this is interesting to note as you go on reading in this uh, uh, chapter, and we're going to consider this next week, where Reuben lay with uh, Jacob's concubine, Billa. And do you know that the reason that the Lord came through Judah is because Reuben, it was Reuben, that, like, I, don't, I don't know if I said it right, Reuben, it was because of what Reuben and what uh, Levi and what Simeon did in this chapter. Uh, the, the, the promised seed was not going to come through their line, but through Judah. And somebody said, well, Judah must have been better. No, read about Judah. He was just as bad as the rest of them. This is just God's sovereign grace. But here we have it. And the land which I gave, verse 12, and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to, <clears throat> to thee will I give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in that place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel, the house of God. Now through this dark chapter, and you can't call it anything but that, and this is God that wrote this. 
Don't forget that. I mean, some people say, well, why would he even read a chapter like that? Because the gospel is in it. And the way Jacob said, you, you've made me to stink. You've made me utterly corrupt. I've been destroyed. I've, they've been gathered against me. It's over for me. Now, that is what happened in Adam to me and you. But thank God and God said. Jacob didn't ask for God at this time. He didn't ask for mercy. He seems to be totally in despair. It's over for me. And God said, Arise. Go back to Bethel, the place of the ladder, and stay there. May that be the truth with regard to me and you. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in Christ's name, by your spirit, you would say to each person here, arise and go back to Bethel and stay there. Would you do that for Christ's sake? In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, Dwayne.